my favorite time of the year. I just really enjoy. We, Teresa and I, uh, a few years back, were able to build us a little thing outside where we have a place to build a fire, and uh, we like to sit outside under the stars, and I know everybody's got their own thing you like to do, but we love to get outside, and, and especially in the cool weather. Now, when it gets too below zero, I like the heater also in the house. <laughs> but when it's in the 50s, it's really nice outside. So I appreciate the goodness of God, all that He's doing. Thank you all for your, your asking. And I know that uh, I'm going to give you an update on Teresa here just in a minute. But while it's on my mind, my mother is circulating a card tonight for Teresa. And so if you guys haven't got an opportunity to sign it yet, please do so before you leave. She has that back there, and we'll take it and give it to her tonight. So thank you for your prayers and for your calls and your texts, and she's doing well. Uh, She uh, wants to be doing well quicker, but uh, as all of you know, somebody that's active don't like to be down. And uh, I told her today, I said, now, honey... On Friday, uh, I'm going to do the washing, the clothes. And so, (laughs) I had a meeting today at 1130 that I had to go to, and I had her ice pack all fixed, and it was circulating and all that good stuff. And I said, don't you you get up and go nowhere. And so, I come home from the meeting, and the washing machine's running. I said, what is this? And I knew what it was. She didn't want me doing the washing. She was afraid I'd put something in it and turn its colors, which I probably would. You ladies know things about that. Miss Bonnie, it's so good to see you and your precious son back there. We're glad you guys are here. Miss Bonnie Caldwell was part of our church for many years, and now her son has whisked her off down to Middle Tennessee and built her a house on his house. And so she's got her own little place down there, and we're so thankful that they've come tonight to to visit us. And she's looking just as pretty as she ever did. It's so good to see you, Miss Bonnie, and I'm glad you're you're here. Well, this is already September the 6th. Can you believe it? It's already September the 6th. Before we turn around, it's going to be Christmas. So I hope you've got your list and you're checking it twice. But uh, it's going to be here before long. So uh, let me remind you, those of you who want to go to the Rio 25-year celebration, if you don't tell me tonight, tonight is the last night, I have to phone it in in the morning if you didn't get online, and tomorrow that website will be taken down, so you can't register. If you're not on there uh, already, then let me know tonight if you want to go and, and uh, I'll have to call your name in, and we'll make sure that you're on the list. That's something that you don't want to miss if you're interested in the Rio Network. I'm not sure what all is going to happen, but I can promise you it's going to be exciting. There's a whole team of Panamanians that are going to be there. Roberto Tayton, some of you, I've had him speak at our church before, and uh, many of you are, are familiar with him. He's been a part of this network for 25 years And so uh, a lot of his people from Panama will be there, and that will be a part of the celebration. And then I'm sure that each individual churches are going to be talked about and mentioned as we uh, have added to the network as the years went on by. So uh, please try. It's out at the airport, Hilton, and I'm going to take a stab at the date. It's September the 20th or 21st? 21st. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up for me. 21st of September. I believe that's on a Thursday night. Is that correct? Pretty sure that's right. A Thursday night at the airport Hilton. But you can't go unless you've RSVP'd. So I hope that you have or that you will let me know tonight. So let's get into this lesson tonight. We are on lesson number 18. Uh, Lesson number 18. It doesn't seem possible that we've been going this long uh, and only gotten this far. We're on chapter 9. And we'll be looking at chapter 9, the last part of chapter 9, and a part of chapter 10 tonight in the lesson that we're looking at. So we're going to be talking about the sixth trumpet, the sixth trumpet 
of the seventh seal, the sixth trumpet of the seventh seal. Now, last, the last seal of the seven seal scroll contains two judgments. And before we get into all of that, I want to welcome all of our Facebook friends. We're glad you guys are watching tonight. And I just learned last evening uh, from Vinny and Kim that we have picked up another Facebook follower, uh, one of their campers out there, fell in love with our church while they were out there. And they are from, uh, I believe, Duluth, Georgia, somewhere down in, in Georgia. And guess what their last name is? It's Buchanan. And so I thought, praise the Lord, got some good folk all the way down in Georgia. But anyway, they have fell in love with our, our services, and we say hello to them. Uh, they've been watching on our, uh, they got our church app, and they've been looking at all of the, the, the messages and all the teachings on there. And so we welcome them uh, to the Rio East family, and we hope that you enjoy and that God blesses you and blesses your life. Let me square up some stuff here. Uh, in the get-go of us going into this thing. Uh, well, let me just read this, and then we'll come to it. Uh, the first is the seven trumpets. The second is the seven vials, or the seven or the bowls of wrath. And in our last lesson, last week, we learned the fifth trumpet is the first of three woes. Now, I know all this is confusing, but we'll try to break it down as we go through it. When the fifth trumpet sounded... An angel was given the key. This is last week we talked about. It's in the first part of the chapter 9 in Revelation, the first part of it. And when the fifth trumpet sounded, an angel was given the key to the bottomless pit. That's the abyss that was talked about there. When the angel opened the door, evil spiritual beings were loosed to torment unbelievers on earth. And we said that those beings were like locusts, and they could not kill, but they could sting. They had a stinger on their tails like a scorpion. I made a statement last week, and I want to clarify it, because I believe that after studying deeper into it, I don't believe that my statement was right. I followed a particular teacher that I have great confidence in, and I, I have just a little bit of disagreement in what he said and I, after I said it last week, it bothered me a little bit in my spirit. You ever done things like that? And, and, and you want to study it out and make sure that you're, you're clear in your own spirit. And I will tell you right up front, it makes absolute, absolutely no difference in the world if you're saved, what the answer, what the right answer is to this. It makes no difference because you're not going to be here. We're going to go be with Jesus when the rapture takes place. But last week I said that I believed and I was following this particular teacher that I listen to quite a bit and that I follow quite a bit. And, and, and he's, I feel like he's dead center. But last week we said that we felt like that the angel that fell from heaven was a specific angel and that it was not Satan. And, I, and, and after much study and, and much digging and much thoroughness of getting into this, I'm going to have to agree with Brother Robert. I, I believe that it is Satan, and I'm not sure about the time frame. You know, Jesus made mention in the New Testament that he saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven, and then that scripture last week in chapter 9 kicked off with that, with an angel that fell from heaven. So I'm not sure if that's exactly the same time frame, but with this angel having the key to the pit, I believe God has given Satan the key to open up this abyss. And uh, there's several reasons for that that I don't have time to get into tonight. But if you want to spend some time with me privately, I'll be happy to dissect some of that stuff for you. But I'm just wanna, I just want to let you know that I'm changing what I said last week. And uh, if you took and wrote down what I said, scratch it out and say, Brother, Brother Dale changed his mind. I don't believe that's the way it was. Will you do that for me? And uh, I believe that it is, I believe that is Satan that was given the key to open that bottomless pit. In my mind, I couldn't rationalize why that God would go, st go take the keys from Satan in, 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 from hell, steal the keys, take the keys. He paid for them. He took the keys from hell, the keys of death, hell, and the grave. But this is a whole different set of keys. This is a whole different ball game. 
And so I think that, I think that we're on, on task there. Let's go ahead and read the Scriptures, and then I want to break them down some. Time is going to get away from us if we don't get on with the program. But we're looking at lesson number 18. This is the sixth trumpet of the seventh seal. And we're looking at Revelation 9, 13 through 21, and then we're going to get into chapter 10 and go about the first 10, 11 verses there. We're going to look at that here just in a few minutes. Then the sixth angel sounded... And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was two hundred million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hastent blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. Verse 19, For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. Isn't that a sad story? The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. That's verse 20. Verse 21, And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So as with the fifth judgment, talking about chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, at the sound of the sixth judgment or the sixth trumpet, another judgment is unleashed on earth, and John sees an army of 200 million. And in the King James, it says 200,000 thousand. So that's 200 million is what the, what the actual number is talking about here. So when the sixth angel blows the trumpet, John hears a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God. The golden altar is that original altar of incense that's talked about in many places in the Word of God. In the Old Testament, the altar of incense was overlaid with gold and had four horns, each at each corner. You remember last week, and, and, and a little bit, I believe, the week before that, we talked about when Moses got the vision, and when he got all the dimensions of everything. We remember that, do you, do you remember me saying that it was a vision of the reality of the real, the real things that were in heaven, and Moses was to set it up and, and have it made uh, and, and, and do the dimensions and everything, the replica. So this is a replica that was constructed according to the original that is in heaven, which God allowed Moses to see while he was on Mount Sinai. If you want to read about that, that's in Exodus chapter 25, verses 9 and verse 40. It's also in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 5. So from the golden altar comes a voice speaking to the angel who has the sixth trumpet that says, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So since they are bound, we know that these are fallen angels or demons. The expression, the river Euphrates, occurs several times in the Old Testament. It's marked... It marked the eastern boundary of the promised land during the reign of King Solomon, according to 1 Kings 4.21. It symbolically marks the boundary between good and evil, or between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. So when these fallen angels are released, you might say that the gates of hell are opened. When these fallen angels are released, there's something that happens in the spirit realm and I'm not sure that we can fully, as human beings, understand exactly what all goes on. And I'm going to tell you, if anybody says that they understand exactly, completely, 
all of this, I want to talk to them. Because if they understand every bit all of this, and I don't believe there are any secrets, I don't believe God keeps secrets from people, but I believe that there's so much wisdom and knowledge and so many things are going to happen that I believe it's impossible for the human brain to comprehend it all. The Bible says, or, or I said the Bible, history says and psychology tells us that we only tap into about 10% of our brain. But I know some great people that are scholars like Robert that probably gets into about 15% of his brain, and I still bet you that he can't. I've already caused a fight on the front row. Husband and wife disagreeing here. Just kidding. Let's march right along. Let's, let, let's don't cause any fights in the church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So since these are, are bound, they are fallen angels or demons, according to Jude 1 and 6. Now Jude only has one chapter so if you hear me just say Jude 6, that means chapter 1, verse 6. I don't usually say the chapters since there's only just one. But Jude 6 tells us about those demons or those fallen angels. The expression, the great river Euphrates, that, that's a marked boundary. That's a marked place. And that's why we feel like, and I agree with the folks that I've read from, that feel that when, that when that thing is loosed, when those angels are brought out of that area of the river of the Euphrates, the gates of hell, we see all kinds of destruction begin to happen. The loosing of these angels is precisely timed at the hour, the day, the month, and the year that they are to be released and to kill a third of mankind. Isn't it amazing how God is always right on time? The Bible talks about when the fullness of time had come. There was a baby born in Bethlehem. When the fullness of time had come. And you'll find that many places through Scripture. And it always is on God's timetable. Did you know that every day that you have is a ticking clock? Did you know that we are on God's timetable? I told somebody this evening, I wish Jesus would come back tonight. Man, there's so much stuff going on in this world. There's so many things that I hate to have to worry about and to fool with. And yes, I know I'm not supposed to worry about anything. I'm supposed to give it all to the Lord. But isn't that tough sometimes? Isn't that tough? So sometimes it's easy to say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and get us out of this mess. Come quickly and get us out. But anyway, everything is on time. Nothing, absolutely nothing takes God by surprise. Your Bible says that God raises up kings and He sets them down. He already knows what's going to happen in 2024 election if we make it that long. If we don't make it that long, we'll let somebody else elect the person that's still here. We won't have to worry about it no more. We're going to be crowning Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm looking forward to that. But at the opening of the fourth seal, in, in verse 6, chapter, in chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, one-fourth of the population was killed. One-fourth of the population. So the loosing of these three fallen angels is precisely at the hour, the day, and the time that's supposed to happen to kill a third of mankind. And then it says, at the opening of the fourth seal, remember that back in chapter 6? All the way back in chapter 6, we're in chapter 9 now. But in chapter 6, one-fourth of the population of the world was killed. Therefore, these two judgments alone result in the death of approximately one-half of the world's population. So we mentioned the other day, how many people are on planet earth? Seven point something billion. Uh, almost, they say it's climbing real fast toward eight billion now. So if a half of the earth's population, now we know that some of us is going to be missing, so we're not in that number, praise the Lord. So that number is going to come down some. But a, a half of the world's population is going to pass at this time. It's going to be dead. This fulfills Daniel's prophecy that there will be a time of great trouble as never has been since there was a nation until that time, Daniel 12 and 1. Next, John sees an immense army of 200 million horsemen. 200 million. Now, you can get on the internet 
You can get in Dake's study Bible. You can get in, uh, I've got about uh, probably 12 different study Bibles that I use that you can look at and you can get so many different opinions on this. I'm not really sure that anyone knows exactly who this is or what this is. So I'm going to read to you what the Word of God says it is. Okay? Is that fair enough? I'm taking it face value. There are people that teach that this 200 million man army is the nation of China. As it stands right now, China does not have enough people in their whole, their whole country to come up with 200 million people for the army. So, uh, according to statistics, this army can be taken literally or interpreted as an army of demons. That's the way I believe it is. I believe it's an army of demons. Either way, if it's an army of demons or if it's an army of men, those men will be demon-possessed. Are you with me? So either way, it's bad news. Either way, it's tough stuff for the folk that are living here on planet Earth. So a literal interpretation is possible, though no army in the world comes close to that number at this present time. The People's Liberation Army, the PLA of China, comes the closest with around 3 million active troops. If you go from 3 million, and that's what we're told currently, I think it's currently up to 3.4. We don't know how many that they really have. That's what's reported. But about 3.4 million active troops. But if you go from that to 100 million, that's a lot of difference, isn't it? 100 million, 3.4 million is a lot of difference. However, China has a population of 3 China has a population of 1.3 billion. So China could theoretically draft and field an army of 200 million if they took all their teenagers and a lot of their women and give them a rifle or give them whatever and put them in. So that, that is a possibility. I don't think that's what it's talking about, but it's a possibility. John describes the army's horses. Why don't I think that's what happens? Is because of the description that John gives. There's a horrendous description that comes here that tells what the riders look like, and it tells the things that they're going to be doing. Now, I'll give you a little more description when we get into it, but some people say that John is seeing this, and John has never seen a helicopter uh, that's shooting uh, you know, fire out of the, the sides of it, and that that possibly is what he was seeing. I don't know, and you don't know either, but you don't want to be here, okay? You don't want to be here. We need to get out of here before this mess takes off. John describes the army's horses as wearing breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire, sapphire and of sulfur, and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire, smoke, and sulfur came out of their mouths. These are obviously not literal horses, but could be a literal description in ancient terms of modern warfare with tanks and mechanized armor. And again, like I said, this is a person's opinion. It doesn't say in the Word of God that this is China's infantry and that the tanks are marching across the land and the fire's coming out. The, the Bible doesn't say that. People are taking things and putting them into what if this were that. And like I said... If that indeed is what it is, then it is demonic in its background, it's demonic in its power, it's demonic in the force. But the word plagues that we find in chapter 9, verse number 20, are you with me? That word plague is used in the book of Revelation to describe the destructive judgments. The destructive judgment, those things that absolutely destroy so those who are not killed by these plagues at the sounding of the sixth trumpet don't repent of the works of their hands, nor do they give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze, stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. So today, many people worship things of these same materials. Did you realize that? 
You might say, Brother Dale, we're not a nation who goes and bows down to a golden calf. We don't do those kind of things, so we're not guilty of idol worship. But let's break down what idol worship really is. Does anybody know the, a good, clear, clean definition of what an idol is? Perfect. Anything that we put in place of God becomes an idol. So how many people do you know, and certainly there's nobody in this room, I'm sure, that has any idols, but how many people do you know that have boats that they take to the lake and they decide that that's what they're going to do? I'm not against boats. Don't go and preach that Brother Dale said that boats are from hell and they're an idol. If you put them in front of God, they become... How many of you know that some people put a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Some people put football. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. Football, really? Who said that? Oh, she said that. But isn't it true? We just heard the other day, I think it was from Joy on Sunday morning. Who was that girl that Joy was talking about? Who? Who? Taylor Swift. I did hear on the 6 o'clock news one evening, I was watching the news, and they had an excerpt of some girl that was crying, that was threatening suicide because she wasn't able to get a ticket to see Taylor Swift that cost $1,600 for one person. Now, help me figure out, would you not say that that person has their priorities misplaced? And we know that those kind of people need Jesus, but we also know that that is exactly the same thing that the nation of Israel was doing when they melted their gold and they put that gold up when God said, Thou shalt have no, uh, I'm going King James on you here, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. God was saying, I'm number one, anything that goes in between me and you is an idol. And you're not to worship idols. So you might say we don't do the golden calf thing. We don't do the football thing. We don't do the Taylor Swift thing. But what do we do? What gets in between us and God? What does God, when He comes at us and He wants our time, and what does God say when He scratches His head and He says, uh, Dale, I haven't talked to you in a week and a half. What is taking your time? I hope that never happens in my life, and I hope it's not happening in your life, but if there's something that's getting, and maybe I'm talking just to people on Facebook, so Macy, I love you. If any, <laughs> I can pick on Macy, she's not here, can't I, RC? But anyway, whoever we are, wherever we are, we need to understand that this book is just as much applicable today as it was all of those thousands of years ago when the writers wrote it, and they were writing to people that were bowing down before molten images of gold and silver, and even some of them were made of wood that people's hands had made. And the Scripture here just said they can't talk, they can't walk, they can't feel, they can't see, but they are projects, they are products of people that have made things that they were putting up to worship. And God says, it's crazy. It makes me sick. But you're putting an idol up. And what this verse is saying, those people that are doing those things, and I hesitate saying this, but I'm going to say it since one of you brought it out. Those people won't even ask for forgiveness for putting football, for putting anything between them and God. They're not even going to ask for forgiveness. They're not even going to realize that they're missing it completely. They're not even going to realize that all of this destruction and all of this stuff. Did you know that when God sends destructive powers, when God sends plagues, when God sends all of this stuff, that He's still hoping that somebody will turn around and repent? Why do you think that Scripture's in there? God's hoping, but yet His Word says... They don't even turn around. They don't even repent at that. You say, Brother Dale, even during the great tribulation? Yes. Even during the judgment of God. Even during the pouring out of the wrath of God. And I've heard preachers preach and say, the door is shut when the, when, when the church leaves the earth. The door shuts and nobody else is going to be saved. It's not true. God's mercy is still continuing. 
Your Bible says that there's a great multitude that's going to be saved that no man can number that comes out of the tribulation. So that tells me the Holy Spirit is still moving. God is still loving. God is saying, I want you to be saved. I still love you. I want to spend eternity with you. Why can't we see that? Today, people, many people worship things made of these same materials. We said idols are anything that takes God's place including money, power, possessions. Isn't it easy for possessions to get a hold of you? Isn't it easy? You know what I've decided? Anything that attaches you too much to this earth that you want to stay with more than you want to go with God is too much. There's a scripture that talks about don't get too attached to this world. Don't love the things of this world more than you love God. It's okay to have a wonderful life. It's okay. You don't have to walk through life with your lower lip cleaning the carpet. You don't, you don't have to do that. You can be happy. You can be blessed. You can live a good life. But don't get so attached to this life that when the Lord calls, you're not ready to go. Because better things are waiting. The fact that they do not repent is almost incomprehensible. Considering all the judgments that have been taking place on planet earth, and the preaching of the gospel. You say, Brother Dale, the gospel is still being preached? At least 144,000 Jews that we know of are missionaries that are preaching the gospel across the globe. And people still won't repent. So this corresponds to the ministry of Jesus in Matthew 11. Verse number 20 and 21. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Jesus Christ himself, walking on the face of the earth, working miracles, doing great and awesome things, and they wouldn't believe. The Bible says that his own family didn't believe that he was the Son of God for a long time. Verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida. Have you heard that word woe before? We've been talking about the angels saying that, haven't we? Woe means you better look out. Bad stuff's are coming. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and in ashes. Judgments and miracles don't cause people to believe and repent. Therefore, unbelievers on earth during the great tribulation they won't repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. The word translated sorceries is the same word. It's the Greek word. It's also, if you, if you, if you bring the, the meaning out of uh, Hebrew, it's the same word that means pharmacy. In Greek, it's pharmakon. And it's the word from which we get pharmacy, which means drugs. So during the Great Tribulation, drugs are going to be rampant. We think they're bad now. It's going to be an open door. Drugs are going to be everywhere. This seems to indicate widespread drug abuse. However, the Greek word can also refer to potions, mediums, and witchcraft. So when the devil is turned loose, there's going to be all kinds of crazy stuff going on. The trumpet judgments become progressively more devastating. Yet, there is no evidence of any, of any repentance on the part of most of humanity. So after the 200 million army, John sees something, and I don't think that I'm going to get any uh, disagreement about who I think that he's seeing. The second thing we're going to talk about tonight is the mighty angel with the little scroll. The mighty angel with the little scroll. And that we now are stepping into chapter 10 of Revelation. And we're going to look at the first 11 verses. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. If you're taking notes or if you're writing in your Bible, that's where we'll be. I'm going to go ahead and read the first 11 verses. And then we'll come back and look at them as we can. I saw still another mighty angel. Say that word mighty. I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Notice there's a difference here. Brother Robert, what happened to the other angel? He fell out of heaven. I was picking on Robert because he keeps me corrected up here. 
But when this angel, look at, look at this angel, what, what happened to him? He didn't fall nowhere, did he? I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow. Where have you seen another rainbow before in Scripture? You can study several places in Revelation, and you'll, you'll find that the, the throne of God is encircled with a rainbow. But a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, uh, there again is another reference for you if you want to look it up. The lion of what? The lion of the tribe of Judah. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. The, then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So let's look at this and see what, it's, what I believe that it's saying to us. There's now an interlude or a break between the sixth and the seventh trumpets, as there was between the sixth and the seventh seals. John sees another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud which symbolizes power and majesty. I believe, I guess you've already picked up on that, but I believe that this angel is nobody other than Jesus himself. I believe this angel is the Son of God. And that, all of this, this majesty and this power, this cloud that we're seeing, symbolizes his power and his majesty. Uh, the angel having a rainbow over his head, uh, could symbolize God's covenant with Noah that he'll never again destroy the earth with a flood. Uh, I, I, I don't know that that signifies anything other than God is a loving God. And this powerful, powerful presentation is just simply showing, I believe, the mercy and the grace of God. His face is shining like the sun, which means he comes in the very essence of God. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, the people were afraid to come near him because his face was aglow. You remember that? And Moses had to make a handkerchief put over his face where the people could come talk to him because his face was glowing so much. That's the way the presence of God and the face of the Lord is glowing. The mighty angel also has legs like pillars of fire, symbolizing God's judgment according to Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. The angel had a little scroll open in his hand which contains the rest of the message that John will deliver. The mighty angel sets his foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. This reveals the massive size of the angel. His feet being on both land and sea indicate that his words will affect both, both land and sea, both people and creatures. The angel calls out, with a loud voice, like a lion roaring, the seven thunders sound. So as John is about to write what he hears, a voice in heaven tells him, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, 
and don't write them, John. So in verse 5 through 7, John describes a solemn scene of the mighty angel lifting his right hand to heaven and swearing that they would be no more delay. There's one translation says that time should be no more. I believe that this translation is more on key because time is going to continue throughout the millennium. If it were not continuing, why would the Word of God say that we are going through a thousand-year reign? The Timex watches are going to continue to work. I don't know about your Timex, how long it's going to last, but I don't believe that time stops when this angel stands up. I believe that what this angel is saying, what the Scripture is depicting, is exactly what's translated here, and it says, let there be no more delay. Let there be no more stopping. We've messed around here long enough. We've seen enough people that have been slain. We've seen enough. It's time now to bring things to a conclusion. It's time to bring things down to a grinding halt. So the, 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 the delay is over. And this, I believe, is the answer. Now, I'm, I, I don't have exact scriptures for this, but this is, what I, this is what I believe. I believe it's the answer to the prayers of the martyred saints who have asked God how long it would be before He judges the earth. Remember the scripture that we had here a few weeks ago and the, and the saints, the martyred saints that were killed during the tribulation were under the altar and they were saying, How long, O God? How long before you venge or get vengeance for our blood? How long before you venge our blood? And I believe this is an answer. I believe when the angel stands up, holds up his hand, he's the only one that can swear by himself. You know, we're not supposed to swear by God or by man or by nothing else, but he can swear by himself because he is the where the buck stops. The buck stops here, as the old saying goes. So he can do that. But uh, how long will it be before he judges the earth? It also answers the prayer of the saints throughout the centuries. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6 and 10. Now when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled. Just as he announced to his servants the prophets, next John is commanded to take the open scroll from the angel's hands and eat it. He also tells John the scroll will make his stomach bitter, but in his mouth it will be as sweet as honey. There's a similar situation in the book of Ezekiel that I found. Ezekiel is told to eat a scroll and to speak the words to the house of Israel. The symbolism is obvious. John is to be a spokesman for God, we also must eat or digest the Word of God before we can be His spokespersons. How can we speak what we don't know? You can go out of this place tonight and say, Brother Dale said, and it'll get you uh, um, uh, a nothing. But if you go out of this place and you say, Thus saith the Lord, then that carries weight in time and eternity. So what's happening here is John is told, take this book, which is the Word of God, which is the direction of God, which is the prophecy of God, which is the fulfillment of the things to come. Take this book and speak it, and it becomes bitter in your stomach. Do you remember when, was it Jeremiah? Was it Jeremiah that got so confused and so frustrated and the people wouldn't do what he prayed for them, for them to do and he tried to get them to straighten up and he said uh, he was the weeping prophet and he went home, the Bible says, and he put his head between his legs and he cried and he said, I'll not speak the gospel anymore. Wasn't that Jeremiah? And then he said, but it was like a fire shut up in my bones. I had to speak the Word. That's what happens when you get the Word of God down on the inside of you, and if it stays there, it causes you to be uncomfortable. Are you with me? That's what he's talking about here when it makes the stomach bitter. If you don't get the Word of God out of you, when it stays in you, you know you're challenged to take it and give it to somebody else. You know that that's why you eat it. Is so that you can digest it and give it to somebody else. Give it out. Spiritually speaking, that's what's supposed to happen. 
to all of us. When we get the Word in, we should give the Word out. It should make us uncomfortable on the inside if we don't do something with it. So, we also must eat or digest the Word of God before we can be His spokespersons. Though God's Word is sweeter than honey in our mouth, but His... Though the word of God, wait a minute, I lost. My, though the word of God is sweeter than honey in our mouths, according to Psalm nineteen ten, it can become bitter when digested. This is because it reveals sin also in our own lives. Have you ever uh, been listening to the word of God, or maybe you've been reading the word of God, and all of a sudden you realize, ouch, ouch, that hurts. I need to fix something right there. And that's what the Word of God's talking about when it says it's like a two-edged sword. It cuts coming and going. When the Word of God is doing what it's intended to do, it fixes stuff. It cleans stuff up. When John eats the little scroll, it's as sweet as honey, but his stomach becomes bitter. And finally, John is told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. This means the prophecies John is to write relate to the entire world. Why would he be told? There's some people that, that feel like that all of the book of Revelation, is spe- specifically the, the judgments, the plagues, the vials, all of these things that are opened and poured out, there's some people that feel like that it's only to the then known world, that it's only to the people that were alive when the Bible was written. But I believe that this scripture right here uh, completely disagrees with that. I believe that during the tribulation period, this whole world will be touched. The whole world will be affected. I believe from end to end, north to south, east to west, I believe the whole planet will feel the brunt of the tribulation period. I don't believe that there's going to be natives in the jungle in, in, in Africa or in the jungle in, in uh, South America that's not going to know that something is going on, that God is shaking the world. Because when the planets begin to fall from heaven, when the meteorites begin to hit the ocean, when things begin to get out of kilter, and the Bible says that there's an earthquake that's going to shake this planet to its core. The whole earth is going to shake. Everybody is going to know that something's going on, that something's happened. So it's not going to be just to the Mediterranean area. It's not going to be just to the area over there uh, where Jesus walked. It's going to be to the whole planet. So it's a warning to the world that God's judgment is being poured out. God wants the entire world to hear His message through John and to respond. God gives the reason for his warnings of judgment in Ezekiel 18.32. Let's look at that. Ezekiel 18.32 says, For I, and here again, is the merciful hand of God, for I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, turn and live. What's he talking about here? Some people say that God is just saying, well, I, I, I hate when somebody dies, you know. But that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies. That's talking about spiritual death. That's talking about a person that's not ready to meet Christ. And God said, I don't have any pleasure in that. There's another scripture that says, the Lord loves the homecoming of His saints. The Lord loves the homegoing of the saints. So uh, this is saying... I I don't have any pleasure at all in a soul that don't turn to me because I know that they'll be forever in torments, forever. Therefore, turn, he said, and live. Turn and live. That doesn't necessarily say that you'll turn and live forever in your physical body, but it's saying when you turn to Jesus, you have everlasting eternal life. And that's what we're looking for tonight. That's what we're expecting tonight is eternal, everlasting life. Is your salvation good enough to get you all through eternity? Is the Lord that you serve, the God that you love, your best friend, is He able to get you all the way through? If you'll stay connected to Him, there ain't enough devils in hell that can keep you from being with God in heaven. We're running out of time here. God desires all people to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth, that's found uh, again in 1 Timothy 2 and 4. 
And that's why Jesus gives us the Great Commission in Matthew 28. I want to look at that just a minute. I didn't put it in my notes, but I feel like I want to share that with you tonight. I know that we all know it. I know that we... i got so many notes in my Bible I can't get through it here. But Matthew 28, I want to look at that. That's the last part of, the, of Matthew there. It's talking about the Great Commission. And uh, I want to look at verses 19. Uh, let's go back just a little bit earlier than that and go back to verse 16. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there. If you're on Facebook, uh, maybe you've got access to a Bible. If you don't, write this down and you can get it there when you have time. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a, mar- a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, He was clearing up their doubt. All power is given unto me in heaven. Wait a minute. I am in the wrong place, aren't I? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm still right where I need to be. Yeah, here we go. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And in verse 19, he's given the great commission. Go, therefore... And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. That is the will of God right there. That's what God wants for you and I. We're not supposed to be worried about the book of Revelation, even though this book of Revelation should be putting... Uh, some bullets in your gun. You follow what I'm saying? You say, Brother Dale, why should we share the gospel? Why should we tell people? Because revelation's coming. Why should we tell people about Jesus and His love? So they can escape this. It's the will of God that people understand the gospel, which simply means good news, that Jesus said, you don't have to go through that. You don't have to be destined for that. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to be absent from God forever. There's good news out there. You can be saved, and it's the will of God that none should perish, but that all come to repentance, that all turn from a life of sin, that all accept the sacrifice that Jesus paid. And so our job, teach them to observe all things. Miss Sherry has got such a burden to work a discipleship, to work a mentor situation. And what that's really intended to do, Jesus said, make disciples. And as we make disciples, they make disciples. And what that discipleship does is it causes us to really get in love with Jesus and get that desire to share it with somebody else. You can do that. You can do, we can do that. When the love of God becomes so powerful and so forceful in our hearts that we see humanity as people dying, lost without Jesus, and our heart aches because we don't want to see. I was praying this morning. I said, God, please give me more of a desire to see people born again. Give me more of a desire to not see judgment on somebody, but to see Sunday morning I was preaching and, and, and I heard myself say, you know, if the, if, if the drag queens that come into this area for the show uh, would come to Jesus, He'd save them. He would say, if Hitler would have come to Jesus, He would have saved him. He would have forgiven him. If, if, if anybody will turn, repent from their wicked ways and come to Christ, the Lord will save them and set them free. Even during the great tribulation time, if they would come, God would turn them. The judgment of God is in one hand, and the mercy of God is in the other hand. You want to ask me about the rainbow over that angel's head? I believe that angel is, I believe that that Jesus is just showing mercy still there. Mercy, if you'll turn to me, I'll have mercy on you. Not only is it showing the power and the grace and the graciousness of the Lord and the great splendor of a rainbow, but He's showing the mercy. What did the rainbow do in the first time? I'm not going to let it happen to you again. I'm going to give you mercy. I'm not going to let you be destroyed by water again. That was God's covenant. He's sending mercy. So there we see the rainbow over that great angel. What a God we serve. Do you love Him tonight? 
It's 824. I'm going to close up here just a little bit early maybe. Somebody might have some uh, prayer requests that they want to bring before the front. I'll be happy to pray with you if you do. Uh, we want to pray for Brother uh, Bobby Brown. We want to ask him to come on up here just in a few minutes. And those of you who will come and pray, 10 o'clock tomorrow he's supposed to have a, a stent put in and we want to pray about that. But if you're watching on Facebook tonight as a point of contact, would you just reach out and touch your phone or whatever you're looking at or whatever you're seeing? And I want to pray for my sweet wife tonight, a special prayer. I know that she gets discouraged because she's used to being running 100 miles an hour. And, and when she's immobile, uh, pretty much now, uh, there's a, too much time to think about stuff that's not getting done. So she gets frustrated about it. But thank all of you all for your prayers and your gifts and the good food that people's been bringing i feel like i put on 10 pounds since she got her surgery <laughs> we've been eating like horses i'm telling you but some of you guys come on up brother bobby if you'll come on up please remember you don't have to worry about this great time of tribulation that's coming that the bible says is the worst that the earth has ever known you don't have to worry about that the bible says that you need to pray that you're not appointed to wrath you need to pray that you can get out of here. And the Lord's going to help us to get out on the first boat load. I believe there's going to be several, Brother Robert and I have talked about this, I think there's going to be several raptures during the Great Tribulation period. There's going to be things that happen that uh, we don't even need to get into tonight. But, uh, for instance, the witnesses, uh, something's going to happen. You know, I believe it's Enoch and Elijah that comes, this, uh, the two witnesses, because they've never experienced physical death. And, I think they're going to have to die, and uh, raptures are going to take place. Different people are going to be raptured. The 144,000 will probably be raptured somewhere during the, the uh, tribulation period, and, and all of that kind of stuff. And By the way, Eileen, before we close tonight, I saw you had a post on uh, Facebook today, and you was wondering who's, going, who's the worship leader uh, since, since, uh, since Satan fell from heaven. I have an answer for you. Are you ready for my answer? How do you even know? I'm answering your question with a question. How do you know Satan was the worship leader? He was? It doesn't say that. It just says that his body, his, his being, had pipes and, and all of that. We don't know that he was the worship leader. So we do know that he was in the throne room, in the presence of God. He was an archangel. And I, I saw that little funny, and I thought, you know, how do we even know that he was the worship leader? There's so many angels in heaven that's worshiping God. The cherubims and the seraphims are crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, 24-7. But I thought that was really cute, and it prompted some thinking. I like some of the responses that you got. My first response was this. I know who it was. It was those that Jesus went and preached to in paradise, and they come out behind him and went to heaven, and they're leading the worship team. That's what I thought first of all. Would you all stand with me? Come on up, Brother Lee, and I mean Brother Bobby, and let's, let's pray for you and ask the Lord to touch. And the rest of you are at liberty to go if you need to go. Let's, let's have a word of prayer, general prayer first. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us tonight. Lord, for every person that's invested their time here in this study. I praise you for that, and I ask you to keep them all safe. Let them have a good rest of the week if you tarry. And Lord, keep us all looking to you. Keep us all ready and watching. Will you help us to have a desire even greater than we've ever had before, that we do exactly what you placed us on this planet to do. Help us to fulfill your desire for our lives, Lord. Let us witness to somebody. Let us tell somebody about the good news. Let us share with somebody. Let the bullets be in our gun that we can shoot toward them to tell them, guys and gals, you want to miss this great time of tribulation. You don't have to go through it. You can go be with Jesus. Help us all, Lord, to do your work and your will. In Jesus' name. And the church said... Amen. Go with God. He'll always go with you. If you need prayer, please come up. We'd be happy to pray with you and for you. Father, we pray for our brother Bobby tonight. No, Lord, we know that he's got some kind of a situation.